So we'll start in a second, but um, just wait a few more moments until everyone has arrived. So, I think we can start. Good afternoon, everybody, um, who is uh, joining this webinar today um, on, on this sunny afternoon. I am Susanne Deme, Managing Director at Bitcom, and just a few um, who are not um, yet completely familiar with Bitcom, we are the German and represent more than 2,700 companies. Um, uh, we assemble more than 1,000 SMEs, um, more than 500 startups, and almost all the big players um, from the ICT sector, and also a lot of front runners of digital transformation in different sectors. So a strong European digital policy and also uh, a fully integrated digital single market are the heart of our concerns. And thus, I'm very happy that um, exactly one week after the EU published its regulation proposal for crypto assets, we can discuss this complex topic today with two high level political speakers from both Germany and the EU. We welcome State Secretary Dr. Jörg Kukis from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, from Germany and also Director Marcel Haag from the EU Commission and um, uh, can discuss both the European and the German um, perspective on crypto assets and regulation. So it's great to have uh, uh, you both here today and, and, and to discuss um, the different uh, perspectives on the topic. And um, I'm looking forward a lot to, to your keynotes with which we start and um, the discussion afterwards. My colleague Patrick Hansen, um, head of blockchain at Bitcom, will moderate this webinar. And um, so I hand over to you, Patrick, now um, to introduce our speakers and to go on with the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susanne, for those welcoming remarks and uh, welcome everybody also from my side. Um, as mentioned, I'm Patrick Hansen. I'm head of blockchain at Bitcom and I have the great pleasure of uh, moderating today's uh, web event on crypto assets. Um, as Germany's digital association, we organize also the largest and the most active cross-industry um, blockchain and crypto network in Germany. We have more than 60 startups in that field, 15 banks, for example, and hundreds of other blockchain passionate companies in various different industries. And uh, together with those member companies, we have been following the regulation and the legislation in the crypto area very closely. We have been, of course, also contributing to the different uh, public consultations, both nationally and on the EU level. And one thing we have always been calling for was a harmonized and binding European approach on crypto assets. And that's why we are very glad um, to see this new markets and crypto assets regulation proposal published now by the EU, EU Commission. So today we're gonna, uh, we're gonna be covering this topic on crypto assets uh, in, in, in Europe together with Two high-level political speakers, as already mentioned, Dr. Jörg Kukis, State Secretary in the German Ministry of Finance, and uh, Marcel Haag, Director for Horizontal Policy Policies at DG FISMA. And uh, we start with two keynotes before moving on to uh, a panel discussion between our guests. And then, of course, at the end, we also have some time for an open Q&A with uh, all our participants here. Uh, Mr. Cookies, Mr. Haag, I think I speak on behalf of uh, most people who are involved in the crypto area when I say that I'm 
uh, truly proud of having this topic discussed at this high political level. And I am very much uh, looking forward to your keynotes. And uh, Mr. Cookies, as uh, someone who is known to be very much interested in, in blockchain or maybe even passionate about blockchain-based financial innovation, I am very glad to uh, hand over the word and, uh, to you and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, um, I think uh, we made it very clear that, uh, that we want to make Germany one of the leading uh, countries for the uh, blockchain industry, for the DLT um, industry. And uh, we really want to make this concept of what do we mean when we devise a digital strategy, a blockchain strategy tangible with, with real legislation and real impact um, on, um, on businesses and the ability to set up companies because we do think this will be a, a driver of innovation and where companies get founded, where they choose to locate. So I think it's important that, uh, that we get very concrete about what we mean with our blockchain DLT um, strategy. And um, <clears throat> just a few thoughts on what we're doing in Germany before I go on to the, uh, to the European level. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's extremely important um, that, uh, that, we, that we use this opportunity of the innovative power of the blockchain to drive um, greater choice to consumers, to investors. And what we're doing with a few of our legislative proposals goes into exactly that direction. Um, again, to make it tangible, everyone will agree digitization is a great thing, but we will differentiate ourselves by proving that we actually um, set up a legislative framework and a supervisory and regulatory framework that allows businesses such as the ones assembled on this call to thrive and to prosper, to create jobs and, uh, and wealth and uh, um, <clears throat> everything good. So in that sense, um, I think um, th the fact that we want to turn Germany into a leading fintech hub um, also has a lot to do with this because of course we think that the innovative power of DLT um, is particularly relevant for the for the fintech industry and of course that leads me right into the question of uh, crypto assets and uh, distributed ledger technology i think those things go completely hand in hand so the blockchain strategy of the german government um based is based on um the the uh, the buzzwords of course of blockchain and dlt um, but we thought how can we make this specific and how can we get um how, how can we specifically start um, bringing forward business models that uh, that go into this direction. So we developed about a year ago um, our comprehensive blockchain strategy and uh, for this um, we've been in charge of all of the financial markets um, related um, measures on um, on this uh, in this field. And one of the things that we really want to promote is um, a sound um, supervisory and regulatory framework for crypto assets. And uh, we've set up a few national um, legislations that have been passed with full mindfulness of the European things to come um, because we want to make sure that we can always upwardly integrate what we're doing here with uh, what is planned um, in Brussels. And of course, our current EU presidency is a great opportunity for that. Um, um, BaFin has been quite, um, quite proactive in this case. Um, and has established um, sort of a legal framework for financial assets, um, um, for crypto assets early on in the process due to the classification of Bitcoins and comparable um, virtual currencies as financial instruments under the German Banking Act. And I think that was sort of an important innovation and believe it or not, that was done in 2011. So in that sense, uh, we do have um, the, the I think, appropriate claim of uh, being early um, into this game. So in that sense, I think that's important. But of course, we saw as the courts deliberated over the, um, this decision by a, um, by a supervisory body that legal certainty and legal clarity is only achieved if, um, if, the, if the legislative certainty is also there. And that's why we um, installed in the implementation in the, um, in the national implementation of the AMLD, the um, Anti-Money Laundering Directive, um, sort of as a side note, um, the legislation on crypto custody business, because we do think it's extremely important um, that, uh, that uh, there's security, there's safekeeping, there's trust, there's reliance for investors in the uh, management and protection of crypto assets uh, and private cryptographic um, keys 
so that uh, the, the, the safekeeping, the transfer of crypto assets, which is something that you know, every, anyone who's been in the securities markets knows that this is one of these forgotten basic infrastructures that does differentiate successful um, 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 attempts at establishing an asset class from less successful ones. So it's extremely important to have this safety and soundness. And ever since we established this regime, BaFin has received over 50 applications um, and expressions of interest to apply for this license. So in that sense, we really saw um, that uh, the initial concerns that if we set up a supervisory framework, um, it would detract interest. Quite to the contrary has happened. We've actually seen a big inflow of uh, companies, um, including some of the, the, the large players in this field, who want to use our legislative framework um, to set up shop here in uh, Berlin or Frankfurt or Munich or in one of the other cities. So I think that's important that, uh, that we really see a positive correlation of a, of a flexible and uh, safe rule set with, um, with, uh, with the inflow of business models. The same goes um, or hopefully will go with our attempt to, um, um, as the German Blockchain Federation has said, to, um, to really embark on a, on a very um, large innovation to the German um, civil code and the German securities law, namely by for the first time ever allowing a complete dematerialization, digitization, tokenization of um, our securities market. Um, and we're starting um, not with the small part, but the large part, namely the German bond market. So we basically have the idea to transform <clears throat> and allow investors and issuers um, to, uh, to transform and move the German bond market completely onto the blockchain um, by allowing a um, complete tokenization and dematerialization of the securities um, process from um, issuance to, um, to trading, secondary markets, custody, um, um, and all, the whole value chain essentially can be um, can be digitized. We're going through the legislation at the moment. Um, and of course, the sky's the limit. We're starting with debt because it's easier. It doesn't have stock splits and uh, um, corporate actions to the degree that, uh, that equities have. But you know, once we've established this framework and we've, we've changed the German civil code um, <clears throat> in, in the proper way, um, we can theoretically um, move real estate, um, startup shares um, and equities or anything onto the onto this system. So I think it's important. The key question, of course, and that's still an element of controversy or debate with some of um, some representatives of your industry, is of course the balance of safety and soundness and um, low barriers to entry for innovation. For that, we've established basically two regimes. One of them is the central registry regime, where you sort of have the um, classic central depositories um, who are able to give access um, to the respective stock exchanges and regulatory mark and regulated markets through the central system. But as a second alternative, we also have the path of um, establishing um, the electronic securities in crypto securities registries. And of course, that one is the, the pathway to allow innovative players to obtain a license under the German Banking Act and then to issue electronic securities based on distributed ledger technology um, in this framework, which will be much easier to access. It will be supervised by Wappen, um, um, and uh, but we do want to make sure that the barriers to entry are kept as low as possible while, of course, at the other side, maintaining safety and soundness. And that uh, is, is, of course, a trade-off. Um, the important point is what is the definition of property? And I think the, the, the classic question of property rights and transfer thereof and this, the, the ability to rely on this uh, this uh, legal transfer, I think, is the, the one key part that we want to make sure works, that, that for the first time um, in Germany, tokens and DLT will have access to the um, automatic protection of property rights, um, enforcement, insolvency cases, so all of these things where it gets hairy and tricky, but where um, consumers will either see that a system is reliable or not, um, will be moved um, and become applicable for the token world and the blockchain. So I think that's quite important. Um, and of course, that is, those are some of the things that we're doing in Germany. We also want to make um, APIs of the big platform payment um, um, companies accessible to everyone and by forcing them to open up. Um, all of these things are also parts of our idea 
to foster innovation and um, investment and growth. Um, at the European level, and um, of course, uh, um, um, I'll only be sort of the intro speaker um, because uh, Marcel has much deeper insight into this because he's been writing the legislation, but uh, just some questions um, or um, parts, uh, opening remarks on the, on the European level, given that we're the presidency at the moment. Um, so I think in all of the national legislation that we drafted, one of the key points of criticism has always been, um, why do this nationally, why not do this at the European level? Because of course, um, most of your business models will have a European, if not global character. So in that sense, of course, the German market um, is probably large enough to be relevant, but it's not large enough to scale into business models that can compete with the Americas and uh, the, the Asian um, economy. So I think it's extremely important that we make our legislation sort of upwardly compatible. And that's exactly the goal that we're pursuing. And what we're seeing with Mika and all the other legislative actions that have been published last week is that it actually works, right? Um, if, you, if you have a, a license under the German crypto custody law, we will find ways to make that compatible and uh, transferable than into a European license. So I think that's, uh, that's an important signal to the industry that we want to make sure that there's no thing of dual regime. We just know that until these things are actually implemented in Europe will take a few years, probably in all likelihood, um, including the national implementing acts. Um, so we want to make sure the innovation can start now and you can be safe and sure that when you're investing in these um, these licenses in Germany now, um, that you will have the ability to transfer them and to to sort of upgrade them to the European passport. So I think that's important. Um, I think the digital finance package that was published last week um, is extremely positive. The legislative proposal on crypto assets um, on operational resilience is um, spot on um, in, the, in terms of being relevant and important. The retail payment strategy is extremely important given all the innovation that we're seeing in payments and uh, the, the close link of the payments topic with the other things that we're discussing here. And of course, um, overarching everything is the digital finance strategy so that everyone can see that what the commission is doing here is not only sort of a bit by bit transformation, but uh, literally a huge and strategic approach to move Europe forward in this digital finance area. So I think that's extremely important. Um, it will give a boost towards the digital single market. It will help the sister projects of banking union, of capital markets union. Um, so I think the, the European Union really has a very coherent um, um, plan here and we're proud to take this forward during our presidency. In fact, one of our first acts was literally two weeks after the announcement of the strategy, we're bringing um, both the capital markets union and the digital finance strategy to finance ministers to have a big debate um, next week on precisely how we can make these ideas of the commission um, to legislative acts and uh, make sure that this uh, happens quickly and uh, moves, moves fast. I think the proposal on Crypto assets has enormously valuable um, 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 insights into it. I mean, obviously, I'll only um, <clears throat> start and I'll try to stick to my 15-minute uh, allotted times. But I think the, the, the three key areas which are extremely important for us is um, to, to focus on the one side on crypto assets not already covered by the existing legislation. On the other side, to have clarification to the crypto assets that can already be deemed financial instruments, and as the third element, um, the pilot regime um, for innovative DLT-based market structures so that all of these areas um, <clears throat> have their um, justification and, uh, and their place. Um, in the first area, I think the, the Nika regulation um, can be extremely powerful um, and again, um, in part replace existing national frameworks, but also have this compatibility um, aspect that I think is extremely important. Um, of course, again, we'll have the, 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 the standard tension between safety and soundness and the burden of regulatory um, rules, but I do think Mika is a good compromise on those elements and really has, um, and has a good precise regulatory framework for stable coins with which Europe can, um, can, uh, can um, cope with the com competition at the global level. And of course, the exact reason why we can't call stable coins stable coins anymore um, but uh, um, we have new um, ideas and new um, subsets of stable coins um, I think will be will be an element of the 
of the next um, of the next presentation. Um, of course, then how we move all of these instruments um, into the DLT environment is extremely important, and um, I think. The idea of the Commission to clarify Article 4 of the Directive in MIFID is extremely important in this by including DLT issued instruments under the definition of financial instruments um, will also give a big boost to this industry, give legal certainty um, and, um, and really bring this industry forward. So I think this is important. Um, the, the proposal for the pilot regime is something that we will try under our presidency to already um, move forward to make sure that, um, that uh, DLT-based um, technologies can start influencing secondary markets quickly, that, uh, that we get more speed into the, into the system of uh, securities trading, um, per perhaps also a contribution to risk reduction, cost efficiency. I think DLT will have huge powers to help innovate financial markets in this, um, in this case. And as I said, we'll make sure that the, this regime is compatible with the national proposal that we're working on for our um, electronic securities. So with that, um, let me um, finish off with uh, saying that this is a big challenge, of course, but as you see, um, I think there's huge opportunities as well for this uh, building of the regulatory framework that can spur innovation, can be a world leading regulatory regime that's similar to USITS and many other European ideas may actually become sort of a benchmark to the globe. And um, that really is our amb ambition um, in, uh, in driving this forward that, uh, that Europe being early to the game in, um, in um, finding a framework for this can become sort of a, a, a global thought leader in how to supervise, how to regulate crypto assets and DLT financial instruments. So with that, many thanks and looking forward to the next presentation by, uh, by the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yakukis, for your keynote. I think you mentioned a lot of different points and we're gonna elaborate on them later in the discussion. I think many of us would agree with you that with regards to tokenization, the sky's the limit, um, but uh, before going deeper into uh, our discussion, um, I would hand over to Marcel Haag, who uh, supposedly had some busy weeks. The commission last week published a lot of different proposals and uh, we're very glad that you took the time to be here and uh, you, have, you have the stage. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Business, uh, a busy, busy weeks in, indeed um, for, for um, many reasons. Um, but thank you, let me start by thanking you for, for um, Having organized this um, this event, which is which comes very timely, uh, very timely for for us. I think your cookies has has uh, uh, set out the general the the, 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 the general context in which um, in which we made our uh, our proposals very nicely, and so that allows me not to repeat that, but uh, but uh, to focus on. Uh, on our legislative proposal on markets and crypto assets, the, the MICA, uh, but then also um, uh, uh, go a bit more into the detail of the, um, uh, of the pilot regime um, that is um, already a, an innovative um, uh, instrument, uh, instrument in itself. With the MICA, we, um, uh, for the first time, propose a, uh, uh, a legal framework that, um, that uh, should provide clarity on on those crypto assets that currently fall outside the scope of um, of EU financial services legislation and, uh, and and activities and services around them um, for the crypto assets and, and um, uh, we heard that already that are covered by existing financial services legislation. Um, the Commission uh, has proposed um, an amendment to, uh, uh, to MIFID II to make it clear that uh, traditional instruments can also be issued in a tokenized form uh, on a distributed ledger. Um, uh, let me um, uh, start with, um, with, with Mika um, before going to the, to the pilot regime. Um, we think that crypto assets that are not covered by EU legislation for the time being uh, can can offer a lot of um, a lot of uh, opportunities. Uh, 
for instance, uh, some, some crypto assets such as um, utility tokens can contribute to um, uh, building our capital markets union by allowing for less burdensome and more inclusive ways of financing startups and, and SMEs. And uh, obviously the use, of, um, the use of crypto assets as means of payments uh, can enhance competition by providing a cheap, fast and, uh, and efficient payment, uh, payment tool. But then we are also aware that, um, that crypto assets can raise issues in terms of uh, consumer protection and market integrity um, uh, and also uh, regarding market manipulation. So um, this is maybe a, a, a structure, structural uh, challenges are perhaps not, uh, uh, not as important when, uh, uh, um, when, they, when the crypto asset market is still modest in size. So um, financial stability um, is, is perhaps not a major risk. But we also see that a subset of crypto assets, the so-called stable coins, and, and, and Libra is a, is a point in case, um, can easily reach a global scale. And in that case, we, we uh, have to address additional challenges like financial stability, uh, monetary policy transmission, and also monetary sovereignty. Um, this has also been the subject of a G7 report of last year uh, on global stablecoins and, um, and has also been addressed uh, in the draft financial stability report, which was published in, uh, in April 2020. We are following these, these international discussions and the international work um, uh, that's being done on, on stablecoins very closely. Uh, and um, our proposal also builds on, on these. An important point um, uh, for the development of a sound crypto asset market uh, is transparency. So our uh, Mika proposal uh, requires the, the issuers of, um, of crypto assets to publish uh, an information document, which we call a crypto asset white paper. Um, uh, for the offer of, uh, of, of crypto assets uh, in the EU. Um, the um, Mika uh, proposal uh, also contains specific provisions for asset reference tokens and the e-money tokens, um, which are the new terms that we're using for stable coins. Um, and uh, in that respect, we um, we believe that uh, it's important that our regulation um, uh, supports both innovation and preserves uh, financial stability and investor protection. Um, this means that um, for e-money tokens and asset reference tokens, we're proposing a set of minimum rights for, for, um, for consumers. So e-money tokens, which are defined as crypto assets that reference a single currency, so for instance, euro tokens, US dollar tokens, they will be uh, uh, subject to both the requirements set out in the Mika proposal, as well as the uh, regulatory requirements uh, of the uh, e-money directive. Um, as a consequence, the issuers of such tokens will be required to offer a one-to-one -one redemption right for their tokens against the fiat currency uh, that they are referencing. That's also, um, um, uh, that has also been uh, a strong request of a number of, um, of, a number of finance, uh, finance ministers uh, in, the, uh, in the EU. Um, those asset reference tokens, which are um, uh, either referencing multiple currencies, commodities, or other Crypto assets or a combination of these uh, will also be subject to minimum requirements set out in the proposal. For example, the holders would have the right to redeem their tokens directly from the issuer in case of a significant uh, variation in value. Um, the um, uh, Mika proposal also covers a number of um, requirements uh, for uh, crypto asset service providers. 
um, for instance, custodian wallet providers, crypto asset exchanges, crypto asset trading platforms. Um, issuers of crypto assets and service providers will benefit from an EU passport. This will enable issuers in crypto uh, and, and service providers to scale up their activities in the single market. Um, this will reduce market. Um, this will reduce market fragmentation in the crypto asset market, uh, and 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 overcome divergent uh, national regimes. Now, let me also um, uh, quickly uh, go a bit into the pilot regime on on, uh, on DLT market infrastructures. Um, we have seen uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, sporadic if, uh, issuances of crypto assets that qualify as financial instruments in the, primary, uh, in the primary market. However, this market is unlikely to, to develop if there is no financial market infrastructure underpinning the secondary market for um, tokenized financial instruments. Um, our financial services legislation has not been written with DLT in mind, uh, so our regulatory regime uh, for for um, financial instruments could create obstacles uh, to the development uh, uh, of a um, uh, of um, uh, DLT based financial market infrastructures. Um, at the same time, um, it's very hard for us to say, in the absence of the existence of uh, um, DLT based financial market infrastructures. Uh, what those uh, what those barriers are. So, um, in order to overcome that um, uh, difficulty, um, we are proposing a pilot regime that will enable national regulators to exempt DLT market infrastructures from certain obligations under EU law and under strict uh, conditions. The um, ESMA will also be involved uh, and and uh, and coordinate and, and ensure. Uh, consistency uh, uh, across the EU and, uh, and and make sure that financial stability, consumer protection, and market integrity are being uh, are being ensured. Um, so the pilot regime would then allow us to to to, to gain experience, uh, both market participants and, and, and regulators alike, uh, on the use of DLT and crypto assets in in, in trading and post trading. And then after five years, the Commission would um, uh, uh, would um, uh, examine and, and, and assess um, the experience that we made and make um, and make, if necessary, uh, um, uh, proposals for for permanent um, uh, adaptations to our legislative, uh, legislative uh, regime. This is a very uh, new way of. Um, of of regulating, um, it aims at favoring innovation in, in, in financial markets, but at the same time, it is also it is also um, uh, an innovative legislative instrument itself. Uh, we have not uh, done that before. It's the first time that um, uh, that the um, uh, EU regulators uh, are waiving the application of some rules when uh, these rules uh, inhibit uh, innovation. So let me conclude maybe by saying that, uh, that um, uh, one of our guiding principles in digital finance um, uh, is to ensure that EU legislation is innovation friendly. We also want to ensure that Europe can make the most of the possibilities that, uh, that crypto assets have to offer. And at the same time, of course, mitigate and, and manage the risk they pose. Um, so for us, the proposals on crypto assets are um, clearly innovative and try to regulate innovation in and not out. Maybe I, I leave it there. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Haag, for these insights, first-hand insights uh, from the EU Commission. Uh, in, in order to get the discussion started, I would like to get back at the final point you made about the, the pilot regime and, and, and ask you, Mr. State Secretary Cookies. Um, the, uh, Germany has been 
I would say really reluctant to establish those kind of pilot regimes or sandboxing regimes where um, there are some temporary regulatory exemptions um, for, for businesses. Um, what, what would you say um, are the reasons why this pilot regime now on the EU level, which appears to be the first pan-European sandboxing regime, um, could make sense? And, and what would be the best case scenario of how, of how this pilot regime works out and develops in the future? Well, I think we, we, we have to be um, somewhat um, <clears throat> careful because the, the general principle, same business, same risk, same, same rules, is one that, of course, we cherish quite highly. But I do think the, the two examples that, that I gave um, indicate to you that we are um, very interested in um, you know, finding um, regulatory regimes that allow um, that, that allow specific sectors to grow and prosper quickly and, uh, and find specific rules, um, specific rule sets that, um, that, uh, that fit to the um, business requirements of, uh, of the blockchain industry and DLT business models. So I think um, our approach, um, rather than giving general sandboxes to everyone, uh, our approach has been more to say, to identify those sectors where we do see um, increased activity and where we see specific needs of innovative um, 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 business models and we try to customize and tailor make um, the, the legislative process to make sure that our legislation is up to date enough to allow those business models to prosper. For example, the idea of tokenizing um, German um, Sachenrecht, i.e. The, the material law to transfer things, um, I think um, um, those are, th that probably is um, more useful for someone who's developing a tokenized business model than if we now all of a sudden said that online banks have lower requirements in terms of, um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, capital liquidity um, reporting or other things. So I think we're not opposed to um, keeping our rule set um, um, innovative and designing it in such a way to, to help innovative business models grow. Um, we were just a bit reluctant um, from a consumer protection perspective to just lowering rules for, um, for entire business models. But I think it's no difference and it, we don't see ourselves in a conflict between the approach that we have and the EU approach, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and also, since uh, since the Libra project was was already mentioned a couple of times, I would I would like to know uh, from you, Mr. Cookie, since uh, a couple of weeks ago, the German finance minister Olaf Scholz he he stated again, alongside with uh, some of his European colleagues, that private forms of money or so-called global stable coins such as Libra Libra are are a threat to to our national sovereignty and and should be prohibited as a last resort. Um, do you consider now the, the regulation which is, seems to be put in place in Europe, the MiCA, to be in line with uh, what uh, Mr. Scholz and, and some of his colleagues have repeatedly been saying about banning or prohibiting Libra? It's definitely going in the right direction. I mean, whether we, we look at the asset reference tokens or the e-money tokens, I think uh, probably the e-money token version goes closer um, to the idea that we have that um, if there is private forms of money, it should be um, it should be um, denominated in the base currency of the jurisdiction where it's issued. So in that sense, I think um, I think the the, the rules on um, capital requirements, the rules on custody, the rules on investment stabilization reserve, reserves, on interoperability requirements, they go a long way in towards our goal of uh, having a having a safe and sound um, system and uh, and architecture. Um, that um, that make sure that we that we address these risks from the from, uh, from that that inevitably are inherent in in the in the issuance process of stablecoin, um, and of course it's very obvious from a from a so sovereignty perspective we can't allow um, private forms of money to completely take over replace and and um, sort of undercutting um, the strict rules and regulations that we have that serve to protect. Um, consumers um, and establish themselves in competition to to the uh, to the um, to the system that um, has these heavy regulations simply by um, incurring lower cost of regulation. So that's what we mean. That if 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 we can't see 
a system that uh, that makes sure that uh, that these rules are are maintained, then we should um, include um, a ban as a as sort of the uh, the the last resort. Um, the same goes, by the way, to the question. Um, and uh, Mika has a huge number of positive inputs for that to um, to making sure that if a consumer is told that a coin is stable, it is actually stable. Um, <clears throat> um, I.e., what happens with the collateral? Does the consumer have the ultimate right to exchange um, the stable coin into um, safe collateral? How is the collateral managed? Who, to whom does the benefit accrue? Um, um, all of these issues, I think, are extremely important to be um, to be put on a on a clear regulatory uh, framework. Um, we, I, I must admit, uh, one week wasn't enough um, to dig through every single page of the. Um, my team told me 600 plus um, pages they, they have to dig through and it's quite dense reading, I have to admit. Um, so we can't make a final assessment yet, but, um, but I do think it's, it's, uh, it's, this is definitely going in the right direction and we still have plenty of time in council with the European Parliament um, to, to go through the minutiae of whether it's uh, already um, fulfilling all of the requirements uh, that the finance minister has explained. Yes, uh, thanks. I, I think at this point, basically, no one has has read uh, all the documents and, and every document was which was uh, released uh, last week since it, since the digital finance package was was just so all encompassing. Um, but but Mr. Hark, with the uh, exception of Marcel, yeah, <laughs> true, yeah, indeed, true. indeed. <laughs> indeed. Uh, indeed. Uh, but I mean, I, I can only recommend the other parts of the package also for your uh, for 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 your reading. Um, um, please read also the payment strategy and the uh, CMU <laughs> action plan. <laughs> but uh, but since you might be the only person uh, who read uh, almost everything, I would like to to ask you the following question. Um, there was a lot of talk, uh, uh, for example, also the the, the former um, Commission's vice president for financial services, uh, Mr. Dombrovskis. He, he he said back in June that the EU could really lead. Um, lead the way on crypto regulation globally. Um, do, do you think that Mika and the pilot regime and, and, and all those proposals, they, they reflect this kind of ambition? And is the EU leading the way comparing to, to other major global jurisdictions? Um, no, I think uh, obviously it would be difficult for me to, uh, to disagree <laughs> with the uh, executive vice president of the commission. Um, but in this case, I, I, um, I uh, can honestly say that this is also my my opinion. So I, I totally agree. We're the first. We are the first major jurisdiction uh, in the world to propose a comprehensive framework for for uh, crypto assets that that do not qualify as as financial instrument. Um, we are building on what um, uh, uh, international fora and, and standard setting bodies uh, have already done in terms of uh, in terms of preparatory work so um, this is one of the areas in which we are in a, in a very good position to lead the way on on regulation as regards cryptocurrencies and and, and crypto assets more generally uh, and and uh, hopefully with uh, with our Mika approach, which we think is a balanced approach that strikes uh, that strikes the the the, the uh, a good balance between reaping the benefits of um, uh, uh, reaping the uh, the opportunities of um, and and possibilities that uh, that uh, crypto assets uh, can offer and and uh, managing the risks that uh, that they might pose and. Yeah, in terms of consumer protection, market integrity, and, and, and so forth, we um, uh, we set a, a, a standard for um, that that hopefully uh, is one that uh, uh, that um, the the world can can follow, and that could be a model for 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 the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Mr. Cookie, since, since Germany, you already mentioned, has been front running in many of those crypto uh, regulation matters, would you say that uh, maybe German companies, uh, th those 50 plus companies that are already applying for these licenses, would you say that they will 
have a competitive advantage uh, compared to their European counterparts? And, and in general, how, how much will the European um, regulation affect these German initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obviously still um, still ongoing evaluation that uh, that we have. But um, of course, the the first of all, the, the licensing regime um, may stay one where we have the passport principle, right? That i.e., that if you have a license in one country in one member state, then you're allowed to to passport uh, freely in the EU 27. Um, and uh, so, in that sense, I think obtaining a license in one of the EU member states can already be quite helpful. And of course, um, as always, um, usually in Europe we have sort of uh, um, grandfathering rules that if you have a license, then you can uh, maintain it for a while. So I do think it's a competitive advantage and an opportunity um, for this uh, for 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 you then to to. Um, to um, um, to to remain authorized. I mean, for example, the the um, regulatory proposal um, that we have um, means that uh, once you're um, authorized under a national regime, you can continue to doing the business for 18 months after entry into the application, or until um, you're granted an authorization um, under MiCA. So I think. Um, the, the European, um, the EU has always been quite smart in making sure that if you have a license in one country for a certain specified activity that's considered um, passportable, then you can maintain licenses and you can expand. So in that sense, I do think it's uh, something that uh, um, that uh, that will be that will be used. And of course, um, when we provide our input and our experience um, to the Commission, the Commission. And looks at what's going on in Germany and France, Italy, Spain, and the Baltics, and many other member states. So I think what we're doing and what we're going through as sort of early adapters is also instructive. Um, just as we learn from the Swiss, you know, it, it passes on. Um, yeah, uh, maybe be, before moving to the to the open Q and A session, I would like to also to to shed some light on the on the time frame, which has already been touched on, um, Mr. Hack. Um, since there's a lot of work still left to do, for example, especially for those asset referenced uh, tokens, uh, those criteria on what is supposed to be significant has to be have to be established. Um, even a new set of supervisors, a new college of supervisors has to be set up uh, from the European Banking Authority. Um, when do you expect all those routes really to come into force and, I mean, to make it really um, to, to illustrate that, when do you expect, for example, Libra to be really able to formally apply for, for, for their license at the EU? Yeah, um, that's a tricky, that is a tricky question. That's a tricky question because that is, of course, not in, entirely in the hands of one single, one single actor. Uh, multiple actors have to uh, I have to come together um, uh, to uh, to actually uh, turn our proposal into uh, uh, actually binding binding legislation. Um, the German presidency is uh, uh, is very supportive, and we're grateful we're grateful for that. Uh, and uh, uh, has already started uh, in the way, in the working group to uh, uh, to look at. Um, uh, at, uh, at our package, um, so we are encouraging the uh, the presidency and the and, and the European Parliament to um, uh, to speed up the work as as best as they can. Um, in the meantime, uh, there is also a lot of preparatory work uh, that has to uh, has to go into uh, um, uh, implement into the implementing um, uh, rules. Um, we uh, have proposed that the regulation uh, would, um, uh, at least the provisions on e-money tokens and, and asset reference tokens, um, would uh, would be applicable uh, uh, as soon as the regulation is um, uh, is approved by by um, uh, the co-legislators and 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 published. Um, so um, uh, it's not clear when this will be. Uh, we hope that this uh, uh, is very soon. 
we've seen in the crisis that uh, that even the heavy heavy legislative machine of the of the European Union can deliver uh, can deliver very very fast. So we hope that um, that this will be also the case here. Um, uh, we have been very clear throughout uh, that we would expect um, uh, no no global uh, stable coin uh, to start operating in in the European Union until um, the uh, uh, legal and regulatory uh, uh, challenges are uh, adequately identified and uh, and addressed. And for us, uh, that that means that um, that uh, um, Mika is. Uh, is, is in place. Okay, so so very much uh, work on on progress for now, but uh, we're we are but, all also clear, but also a clear warning for uh, you know to to the uh, or a, a, a clear um, a message to the um, uh, to the issuers of stable coins that uh, we would expect them uh, to wait until a legislative framework is in place, and of course. They respect okay perfect um, thank you very much I will just skim through the questions in the chat so that we can uh, take some of those and in the meantime meantime we have prepared a quick poll for our audience um, in regards to the new EU Commission's regulation for markets and crypto assets so um, normally you should all see our question here at your screen. And I'm waiting for another five to 10 seconds um, to get your feedback on your satisfaction with uh, the markets and crypto assets regulation. So I will now close the poll and uh, show the results. Uh, also, I hope uh, Mr. Cookies and Mr. Hake that you can see uh, those results. Um, it, it, it seems, I mean, of course it's not representative, but uh, it seems as if most of the people are either very satisfied or satisfied um, with the uh, Mika proposal and that only very few are not very satisfied. So it seems to me, that this is a clear mandate to continue on this on this track, and uh, I mean they are probably also biased by your great uh, keynotes, but it seems a great um, a great feedback for you guys. And uh, I would like to um, take a question from the chat, and um, which concerns the central bank digital currencies. Um, maybe Mr. Cookies. Um, do you think that the central bank issued digital euro would make sense at this point? Uh, or when do you think uh, we will see one in the euro area? Well, I mean, first of all, that obviously is a choice and a decision that needs to be made by our independent central bank. So I'll be very, um, very um, 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 careful in what I say, because at the end of the day, this is a um, monetary policy decision um, that of course has um, has to be accompanied by uh, legislative work, but I do think the the um, the central banks are are the the the, the first decision makers on this. And um, 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 Christine Lagarde has said several times that the ECB is evaluating this very carefully. I do take the um, financial stability risks that come with CBDC very very seriously, especially if it's a CBDC that has a um, retail um, um, component to it. So I think it's absolutely um, vital that all of these issues are scrutinized very carefully. Um, and of course, um, there, there, need to be, there needs to be a specific um, um, USP and use case for the private sector as well. So I think that's, uh, th th that's the work that's ongoing. And I have the impression the central banks are extremely diligent in, um, in doing that homework, addressing um, how, we can, um, how we can address the, um, the financial stability risks. There's quite a few very interesting proposals from the ECB on the table um, that, uh, that um, 
use the monetary policy toolkits to address the financial stability risks in CBDC, uh, but as do have a huge amount of respect for the massive amount of work that needs to be done uh, before something like that can be properly introduced. Yes, yeah, so, so probably not, nothing for the very near future um, for now. And uh, Mr. Hack, maybe last question uh, to you, uh, since we have also a lot of startups in our association and um, a lot of uh, those startups have already addressed their concerns that those rules for crypto asset service providers at the EU level uh, could be a too big a hurdle for them to overcome. Um, what would you say um, with regards to those criteria? Um, are, are they startup friendly in your opinion, or is there probably some work to be to be done um, and, and to to be changed on, on those ones? No, I think that um, that um, overall overall our proposal is very startup friendly. It's very startup friendly. Um, uh, at the same time, of course, we need to establish a framework that addresses the concern, the concerns, and the risks uh, for crypto assets. Um, uh, of course, for the fine tune for the fine tuning of our, of our proposal, uh, we have the um, legislative process, which, we, which gives us the opportunity to look at. Uh, any um, additional concerns um, uh, in, in more detail, but overall, I would say uh, I think we have taken into account what we have heard in the public consultation and um, and uh, to, to reflect this more the proposal that we made. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in light of the time. Although there are a lot of questions left in the chat and obviously a lot of topics left to talk about, we unfortunately have to come to an end here. Um, but I think as we learned today, the, the, the crypto asset regulation and the whole digital finance package will not be adopted tomorrow and not next week, and not, not next month, but will stay relevant for the next couple of months or even years um, as, as work in progress. And uh, in that sense, we as an association, we are very eager to um, keep up the fruitful dialogue with the EU level, but of course also um, with the German level. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Jörg Kukis and Mr. Marcel Haag um, for your time today, for addressing this complex topic. And I think we definitely learned a lot and we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, of course, also to the audience. We hope to see you soon and a uh, good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.